So now we've gotten where we normally would start Revelation chapter six, which is the opening of the seals. Now I'm going to go through Revelation six verse by verse as I usually do. But before I get to that, people have noticed that I think correctly so a lot of parallels between the Olivet Discourse and the seals. Okay. So we're going to kind of go through the Olivet Discourse and we're going to compare the different um, uh, recordings of that by Matthew, Mark, and Luke when we go through there. Now, when it comes to the book of Revelation, this is the part most people are interested in. They want to hear about the chaos, the destruction, the reign of the Antichrist, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? That's what everyone wants to hear about. And they're about to make their debut. And again, praise God that the church is already in heaven at this point. Otherwise, it would be a terrible, terrible time for the church. But we know the restraining force, the restrainer, or he that letteth, as the Bible calls it, has been removed. And if the Holy Spirit, which has sealed us till that day of redemption, has been removed, we've been removed with it. So these 24 elders are sitting around the throne as Jesus took this scroll that's sealed with seven seals and when he opens it, okay? It's interesting that these 24 elders are mentioned here at the beginning and then aren't going to be mentioned again, except to say one of the elders told me this, one of the elders told me that. But in totality, they're not going to be mentioned again until near the end of Revelation when we get to chapter 19. That's because almost everything we look at from here forward is not affecting heaven. It's affecting the earth, right? It's occurring here on earth. What takes a little bit of time in heaven may take years on the earth, right? How long does it take to open an envelope? Click, 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 even if there's seven seals. What kind of time passes on the earth? It would seem weeks, months, and years, right? So all these things are going to affect the earth. And the revelation, whenever we see these things that affect the earth, they are going to affect mainly those who have rejected Jesus Christ those who are left behind, or those who have followed the Antichrist, right? <clears throat> so Jesus actually, whenever he's, during his earthly ministry, he actually asks that when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And it's a kind of a rhetorical question, because on the one hand, we know that things are going more and more corrupt. Fewer and fewer people are calling themselves Christians, and fewer and fewer people are actually Christians. And there is a difference between those two groups. We also know that during the tribulation, a lot of people do come to Christ. But what's the result of those tribulation saints? What happens to them? They're hunted down and exterminated, right? That's the whole thing. So we're going to start seeing those judgments that are revealed by these seals, okay? Um, now, there's going to be judgments under the seals. Then you're going to have the trumpets. Then you're going to have the bowls or the vials, right? And they become very, very severe. And the first four seals consist of the living creatures announcing these horsemen that are coming in, right? These living creatures and these horsemen. The last three don't have any horsemen or creatures or anything like that. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is connected with the seal judgments. He's the one who opens the seals. So every seal that's broken leads to something happening on the earth, okay? So we're going to see the angels, what role they have to play with the trumpet judgments. And of course, we're going to see the father and the role he plays with the bowl judgments. So we have Jesus opening the seals and the living creatures being a part of that. We have the angels blowing the trumpets and we have the father pouring out these vials, these bowls. And we'll get to that down, down the road. So before we get too far into those events, we really should look back on some of the passages from Daniel and Matthew and Mark and Luke, which are all recordings of Jesus's all of it discourse. Okay. This conversation he has with his disciples on the Mount of Olives to tell them what things are going to be like at the end of time. So the first four horsemen of the apocalypse that are released by the first four seals, they're going to include a Christ like figure or famine and then death and hell okay and again this is not the first time this sequence is mentioned it's also mentioned in those gospels at the olivet discourse so i know we have also talked about this in some previous studies but 
remember why we have four gospels. You know, we could have one complete gospel, right? We could just have something copied from beginning to end and including all the details. And some people have done that. They've combined the four gospels into one complete story. And it's interesting to read it that way, right? But they're similar, but they're not identical. And I believe there is a divine reason for that. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. And everything that was done was done with purpose and for a reason. There's a reason that certain stories and certain passages are omitted in one of the Gospels, but included in the other. And then some of the Gospels kind of line up and some don't seem to line up. And there are reasons for it, right? So we talked before, whenever we talked about these four living creatures, that these four creatures in the book of Revelation are very, they have this connection or are very similar to the four creatures from the book of Ezekiel in chapter one and two. We've also talked about how those four creatures are also represented on the banners of the camp of Israel in Numbers chapter one. And it showed how their camp, their military camp, made a cross around the tabernacle, right? We also know that there are four descriptions of the branch in the Old Testament. And the branch is the word for Nazarene, the necker, the Nazarene, right? So whenever it says Jesus will be called a Nazarene, it's actually referring to when he's called the branch. And when he's described as a branch, it says the branch, the king, my branch, the man, the branch, the servant, and the branch, the Lord. So we see the same four representations of Jesus as a king, as God, as a man, and as a servant, right? Same thing that these four living creatures represent with the ox, the man, the eagle, and the, uh, what did I miss? The lion. Okay. So despite all this, right? Some people say, well, couldn't you just still have a single gospel, right? But we should look for the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit as to why they're different and who are they talking to, right? It's not only important what they say, it's important what they don't say, okay? So what is omitted is also valuable information. So Matthew, right, the first gospel in our New Testament, it opens up immediately, and it says Jesus is the Christ, the Christ, the Messiah of Israel, right? And he was a Jew. It, it took his lineage all the way back to Abraham, right? Wanted to show that he was a Jew through and through, right? And he had a claim to the throne. Why? Because he's the legal son of David the king. Matthew points out that David was the king and shows how legally through Joseph, his adopted father, he had a line to the kingship. It then, if you go through the book of Matthew, it's going to get a little bit redundant and tiresome whenever he keeps saying, as was written in the prophets, as the prophet said, as Isaiah said, as this said, because everything about it is showing Jesus the fulfilled prophecy of the Jewish Messiah. That's who he is. Now, a lot of times the other gospels don't bring up as often that he's here fulfilling prophecy, but Matthew is preoccupied with showing how Jesus fulfilled each prophecy. Matthew, he again, had taken the role of convincing us that Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. He was from the line of the king. He was the lion. So if you are going to try to convince right now an Orthodox Jew that Jesus is the Messiah, the best gospel to use would be Matthew. He actually makes all your arguments for you. He shows you just like, look at this prophet. He gives you the cross references, essentially. You can find every reference in the Old Testament and see how Jesus fulfilled each one of these as a son of David. He's actually called the son of David several times in the book of Matthew in chapter 117, chapter 9, verse 27, 12, 23, 15, 22, 20, 30, and 31, 21, 9, 21, 15, and 22, 41 to 45. He, like, you'll have this on record if anybody wants it. I don't know if people like to look him up. Uh, so he proves the kingship of Jesus, and he assumes his readers are pretty comfortable with the Hebrew laws and Hebrew history. He talks about Passover as if you should know what that means, right? And it was written again to the early church and preached almost, which the early church was made up mostly of what? Jews, right? So the goal is to show that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. And that's why the genealogy takes him back again to Abraham. So then you get to the book of Mark. Mark is probably the short, well, it is the shortest gospel. And again, people think, we don't know this for sure, that it's actually a summary of Peter's teachings, and it was written by John Mark. Now, people believe it's Peter because in the books, the book of Acts, 
It's saying that the record we have, it goes back to what happened with Jesus beginning at the baptism of John. Because guess where the book of Mark starts? The baptism of John, right? So he's saying this is the record we have. And that's in Acts 10, 37. It wastes no time on the actions of others. Instead, focuses only on the work and the service of Jesus Christ. The whole book of Mark is about what he did, right? Um, by the ninth verse, he's getting baptized. And by the 14th verse of the book, he's already beginning his ministry. So a lot of the passages come from the Old Testament, but you don't see Mark saying it was written here, it was written here, it was written here. The only time you see that it was written was when Jesus was actually saying those words and he was just recording what Jesus said, right? So Mark, he assumes total ignorance of the Hebrew scriptures as well as ignorance of the Hebrew traditions and laws. Mm -hmm. He actually will explain about the hand-washing rules of the Jews. If you were a Jew, you would know about the hand-washing rules, right? But he talks about the hand-washing in Mark chapter 7, verse 2 to 4. Mark chapter 15, he talks about some of the Jewish festivals. Again, Mark seems to assume you're not a Jew when you're reading this. He translates the Aramaic words for the readers. Jews spoke in Aramaic. But he said this word means this. He explained what the word meant. Because again, he didn't assume that you read Aramaic. That's in Mark 3, 17, chapter 5, verse 41, chapter 7, verse 11, 7, verse 34, 15, 22, and 15, 34. So he was uh, writing more to the Gentiles. More to the Gentiles and likely the Roman Gentiles, right? Because remember, during the book of Acts, they're traveling around to spread the gospel, right? They're trying to tell people, especially the Gentile world, about Jesus. So there are all kinds of references to suffering and discipleship, which of, was, was of particular interest to the church in Rome, because again, this is thought to have been directed, particularly during the persecution of Nero, right, who blamed the Christians for burning the city. And there's all kinds of references to that. Mark 1, 12 to 13, talking about persecution and suffering. Uh, chapter 3, verse 22 and 30. Chapter 8, verse 34 to 38 chapter 10, verse 30, and verse 33 to 34, and 45, and then chapter 13, verse 8 to 13. So this is the simplest and briefest gospel, and it shows Jesus as a servant. And guess what? Nobody cares about the genealogy of a servant. So Mark doesn't tell you where he's from, doesn't tell you about really who, what line he comes from, because he's a servant. He's coming to serve. He's performing actions. Then you get to Luke, right? Luke wrote which two books of our New Testament? Luke, obviously, is one of them. What's that one? Acts. Very good. They were written by Luke, and they're usually associated with Paul, the apostle. Now, they were both addressed to a Greek believer named Theophilus. So throughout the book of Acts, the author of Acts, Luke, right, he refers to himself as we. He keeps talking about we, 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 which means that there were multiple people that he was writing this for, right? So the author was likely Luke and Paul. So Luke was a Gentile, and as a trade, he was a physician. He remained loyal to Paul after everyone else deserted Paul. This is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. The name that the letter was written to, Theophilus, do you guys know what that word means, Theophilus? Theos being God, Phyllis meaning love, the lover of God, right? Somebody who just loves God. That's who it's written to. And he's writing to someone who loves God. Let me tell you about Jesus, right? So someone who loves God, let's tell you about Jesus. So this gospel was used, okay, for, for the reader's instruction. It's a very thorough gospel, right? To teach somebody and to teach others. And that's in Luke chapter 1, verse 4. It also was written to clear up any misunderstandings about who Jesus was and eliminate a lot of the false rumors and false doctrines that were starting to spread in the early church. They're trying to give a accurate and complete representation of Jesus on the earth. He was trying also to prove that the Gentiles could be believers based on the teachings of Jesus. This was a push for the gospel to be spread in the whole world. So it describes the locations in a ways that would in ways that would imply the readers would have never been there. So he'll talk about how there was a mountain to the east of this. There was a valley over here. He gives very descriptive answerings to people that wouldn't be living in Israel, right? 
So we know that it also is not written to a Jewish audience. It uses very articulate Greek language and in the descriptions. Now, we also know that it gives a very, very complete picture of Jesus from his birth all the way to his ascension. And its arrangement is very clean cut, very thorough. This guy was an educated physician, very thorough in his writings, right? So um, and it's very sequential, all written in order. It shows Jesus as a complete human, not just as a Jew, but also to the Gentile. He's a human to the Gentile. And we see that in Luke chapter 2, verse 30 to 32. And in chapter 3, verse 6, it emphasizes that Jesus was human. It shows him being weak. It shows him praying. It shows his baptism. It shows his special concern for women, the poor, for sinners, his stress in regards to his family, right? And rather than calling him the son of David all the time, he is very frequently, 25 times, called the son of man in this one, okay? Doesn't mean he's not called the son of man elsewhere. It doesn't mean he's not called the son of David here. But you see, the emphasis is different, right? So Luke is addressed to this Greek believer, this lover of God, who idolized whoever this perfect man would be. They wanted to see the perfect man. That was the goal of the Greek mind. Luke is portraying Jesus as the perfect man in order to get the point across that he's more than a man. And he uses verifiable historical evidence and demonstrates the rationality of the Christian faith for Gentiles who don't depend on Jewish pro prophecy. People who aren't looking for the Jewish prophecy to teach them that Jesus is real, but actually who Jesus was. And that's why the genealogy takes him all the way back to Adam to show he's a human from the beginning of humanity directly from God. Go ahead, brother. Uh, Chuck Messler thought that Luke's writing Luke and Acts, which he called Luke 1 Luke 2, uh -huh. was Paul's defense papers that would have been sent ahead of him to Rome when he stood before Caesar. Really? So most noble Theophilus, no, most noble God lover, will be addressed to Caesar. If that's the case. That would be interesting, yeah. That's an interesting thought. I never thought about that. So then we get to the final gospel, okay? This is John. And John, he was a deeply devoted disciple of Jesus. He loved Jesus, right? He never counted himself like worthy to be named with Jesus. When he talks about himself in the gospel, he just says the one who Jesus loves, right? Because he just was so overwhelmed with the love of Christ. So he was a Jewish man. And he understood the Jewish customs and he knew the distance between Jewish cities. He knew of the enmity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Remember the Samaritans being from the dispersed kingdom of Israel who were interbred with other people. They became kind of half breed Jews and the Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. He knew all about all that. And he explains all of that in his gospel. So his gospel is thought to have been written somewhat early and is an eyewitness account of course because john is one of the apostles by one of the closest disciples there's going to be a number of other uh of stories in the bible where jesus goes in to do something and he only allows a select few with him usually it's peter james and john and sometimes andrew right so he had kind of the inside view where a lot of the other apostles might not have right so what is John's focus? He's constantly focused on the signs that Jesus does, the miracles of Jesus, his identity as God and his mission here on earth, okay? He's repeatedly making the claim that Jesus is God. He's making that claim and also Jesus is making the claim and John is recording it. So the genealogy in the book of John is directly from God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's the only genealogy given, right? So we know that it was written, again, not to the Jews, but rather to the believer in God. From the very first verse, he says, you know, he is the glory of God. He's the light of men. He just went on talking about how he is God. So he came to his own, and his own received him not. He's saying the Jews rejected him, but the Gentiles, anyone who accepts him, anyone who believes in his name, Will be, has the power to become the children of God. So those who read this gospel are generally already convinced of who Christ is or else your entire intro makes no sense. And Jesus is very frequently in this gospel recorded as calling himself or saying, I am, acknowledging that he is God. That's in John 6, 35, 8, 12, 9, 5, 10, 7, 
10, 9, 10, 14, 11, 25, 14, 6, and 15, 1, and 5. So he summarizes the entire intent of writing his gospel in chapter 20, verse 31. The entire purpose of his gospel is that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and be saved. Okay? So we have four different gospels directed. Now, we all learn something from all of them. Okay? You can't say, oh, well, that was written to Jews. I don't have to read that. No. But there are four different audiences, okay, that he was that they were aiming at. And when you understand there were these four audiences, Matthew written to the Jewish, right, the Orthodox Jewish person, Mark written to those under the Roman persecution, these Roman polytheists that are now seeing God and these Christians being persecuted, Luke being written to whoever this lover of God is, whether it be to Caesar or anyone who looks to God and loves God but doesn't necessarily believe who Jesus is, and then finally John written to the believer, those who acknowledge that Jesus is God in the flesh who died for our sins. So you begin to understand why Matthew includes all these Old Testament references and why the others don't focus on him. You begin to understand why he's the son of David here, but the son of man in Luke, right? And things like that. And why Mark ignores the genealogy and all these things we've already talked about. So remember, the Greeks and the Romans had pantheons. They all believed in multiple gods, right? There was Zeus, there was Hermes, there was Atlas. There were all these different gods and demigods. And the Romans didn't think much of their gods. They were flawed. They had problems. The Greeks also had similar gods, but they did believe in a supreme god that was overall. They just didn't know who he was, right? The unknown god, the unknown god right? So there were Greeks who were looking for the truth and the Romans who were satisfied with their half-truths, right? So we have all these different groups. And so we just got to keep that in mind whenever we read these different accounts. So once you get that concept, you break down all the discrepancies and they begin to make more sense. OK, so this is a pro prophecy class. So we're going to focus mainly on the prophecies specifically recorded in a few chapters. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. OK, now. There's a lot that they have to say, and we're going to get a few different passages from Luke and a few from Daniel and also look at some of the Revelation things. But we have to answer one question. Why would John, the closest disciple to Jesus, not record the Olivet Discourse? We know he was there. We know he heard it. We know it's a very important topic. What's going to happen at the end of your, like, whenever you are talking about the end of the world. Everyone wants to know that, right? Even back then, they wanted to know that. But John doesn't even record Jesus's conversation. Now, some people say, oh, well, he was given the book of Revelation. Sure, he was given the book of Revelation. But wouldn't you write down this? You recorded, you know, parts of this sermon and that sermon. Why would you totally ignore this sermon? Unless the Holy Spirit directed you not to, right? Unless those who believe that Jesus is God wouldn't have to worry about what's going to happen during the tribulation, because they're not going to be here for it. Isn't that a possibility? Again, there's reasons for what's there. There's reasons for what's not. Okay. So again, to the Jew, right, who denies Jesus as Savior, who doesn't accept him, where are they going to be during the tribulation? Sadly, they're going to be here. And sadly, it's going to be a tough time, right? <laughs> I see that they're writing to the four different groups, but they're writing to Christian groups. I mean, these no. are they're Christians writing to the Christians, aren't they? No, they're recording what Jesus did, right? So whenever you actually look at the gospel, all the letters, right? If you they're written to churches, they're written to groups of people who are gathered, but clearly there are some believers and some unbelievers among them. That's throughout all the letters we have, right? Whenever we see that um, Luke is writing to Theophilus to give an explanation of who Jesus is, we can't assume that Theophilus is saved. Somebody's trying to tell him who Jesus is. Why would I need to explain who Jesus is to someone who's saved? So while it's all collected in our Bible and Christians read it, the original writings were records of these eyewitness accounts so that people would know who Jesus was. So no, I don't think they were addressed to Christians. I think John was written as a record and given to the churches as the eyewitness account to Christians. But no, I don't think they were all necessarily recorded 
specifically to be given to Christians, but rather just to give everyone to explain to them who Jesus was. I mean, like Matthew, Matthew, for sure. example, you know, it was the couple of disciples take Jesus aside. They ask Jesus, you know, when, you know, what will be the sign of your coming? When will these, mm -hmm. these things be? They were believers. And then Jesus answered, and Matthew 24 is his answer. Right. So again, now you have to understand the convert. Now, this I'll give a little caveat here. Some people believe these were two different events. They believe the all of it discourse was Matthew and Mark, and they believe the conversation in Luke was a separate conversation. I don't believe that. I believe all, that all of them were the same event. And Jesus said something in Luke that does apply to all believers, right? Pray that you be found worthy to avoid all of these, to escape everything I just told you and to stand before Christ, right? So that means that both those who heard him in Matthew, Mark, and Luke all had that promise. But the point is that statement was excluded from Matthew and Mark. So again, this is the Holy Spirit telling you that in this message, right? If you were to read it alone, you wouldn't see that message, right? Remember in Luke, there's also an addition to the what to what happens in 70 AD, it talks about the desolation of Jerusalem and things like that. We're going to get to all these details. So the point is, any believer would have the same promise. If you are part of the church, you can escape all of these terrible things through rapture, no question. So if you're saying that the, the people who is talking to in Matthew would have that promise, they do. But the fact that in Matthew it was recorded and in that particular line was excluded, it tells you that there is a different message to the people who would eventually read Matthew. To the group that it was addressed to. So also think of it like this, I guess is a more simplified way of looking at it. If I go to the letters of Paul and there are instructions to the husbands and there are instructions to the wives, right? I can read both, but which one applies to me? Obviously the one to the husbands, much more so than the one to the wife. I can learn from both. I can see the heart of both, right? So as believers, we study and we look at all of these things. And we see the promise of escape to us. But whenever we look to see, well, why are there four recordings and why are they written differently? Because it depends on the audience to which they are. So in one of the parables, Jesus says, you're uh, be like men who are waiting for their master when he shall return from the wedding. Right. Well, what wedding? As Christians, we begin to understand, well, that's the wedding of the bride, which means that's the church who has married Jesus. But the Jews who were left behind, because remember, this is pre-cross, pre-resurrection, right? All we're talking about is what's going to happen during the tribulation. Again, the rapture was a mystery later revealed through Paul. It wasn't something that was clearly understood or known here, right? So I know it's a little bit confusing. We will get to it. And as we go through those passages, we'll see the difference. But do you get what I'm saying? That it really, it's not that the people that were in the audience mattered. It's the fact that they were recorded differently. That is what goes to different audiences. Does that make sense? It's one conversation to multiple audiences. Some scholars believe John was written much, much later because he was the youngest of the disciples and that the church had already begun to drift. And John wrote to get their focus back on Jesus Christ, on who he was. And so that was kind of uh, some of the scholars thought that it was written definitely to believers. That's why it's not like the other Gospels. It's so much different. The absolute focus on Jesus Christ is God. All through the Gospel of John to get the church's focus back where it belonged on Jesus. Some scholars. So, I tend to agree with that view. But. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like I said, there's regardless when it was written, it's a very strange thing to exclude by random chance. Unless the Holy Spirit instructed you not to write it. Right? That's the whole thing. And I think there's a reason behind everything in the Bible. So, in regards to the end times, we know that the church at some point is raptured. We know that at some point the Antichrist takes control, and we know that there is going to be a remnant of Israel that's going to be saved. These are facts that everyone agrees on, no matter what view you hold, right? But in regards to the end times, the fate of the Jewish nation, if they're believers, they're part of the church. Right? There were a lot of people that were Jews that accepted Christ. And even today, we have Messianic Jews that accept Messianic Jews that accept Christ as the Messiah, as their Savior. 
so they get raptured. But what happens to the majority, according to the Bible, of the nation of Israel? Well, they go through the tribulation, right? And there's a remnant of them that gets saved. They suffer a lot of persecution, as does the whole world during that time, right? And when does the tribulation end? When they acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, and they say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. He's the one that came to save them. So if there's a book that's addressed and meant to be the audience being the Jewish people, when we talk about this end times, we're going to talk about all the trouble, and you're not going to see a whole bunch about the rapture, because the rapture is for the church. Again, it wouldn't be a major theme, or maybe not mentioned at all. So let's just assume that goes to the Jewish audience. What is the fate of a Gentile who rejects God outright, right? Like the Romans, right? The Roman people did. So what's going to happen to them during the tribulation? Well, again, a lot of persecution. If they follow the Antichrist, they'll fear they'll suffer the damage done by the opening of the seals and the trumpets and such. And if they don't follow the Antichrist, he's going to persecute everybody. And through his peace, he kills many. There's death, there's war, there's famine. It's a bad time, right? So in a book to the Romans regarding the end times, again, you're not going to see much focus on a rapture, right? What about... What's the fate of a Gentile that loves God and may accept him, right? Well, you might get out of it. There would probably be a promise recorded that, hey, here's a list of all these horrible things that are going to happen. And guess what? And there's going to be a time when Jerusalem is desolated. And here's your escape from that. When you see us surrounded by armies, get out, right? And oh my gosh, it worked. Because we know historically that it worked. And oh, by the way, here's the rest of the horrible stuff that's going to happen, starting with the Antichrist. But you can pray that you can be worthy of escaping all that too. So you're going to have the possibility of rapture to the to the Gentile who is maybe going to accept God, a lover of God who may accept God, who has the possibility of accepting. You're going to see the possibility of a rapture. You might be found worthy. What about to the church? Well, hey, don't tell me anything about the tribulation. I won't be here. Wouldn't it be interesting if it was totally excluded? Okay. So that's kind of the approach I'm taking to all this. Okay. So we're going to find that Matthew gives no hope of the rapture until after the tribulation. And there is a rapture after the tribulation, but it's not the rapture of the church. The rapture discussed in Matthew occurs at the end of the tribulation. And then there's another rapture, by the way, of the wicked. So Mark, again, he's talking to the Gentile who rejects Jesus. Again, no mention of the tribulation, of the rapture, excuse me. Um, and their only hope, right, is to not receive the mark of the beast. Remember, if you receive the mark of the beast, there's no escape for you. If you don't receive the mark, you may be able to survive and go into the millennial kingdom where you may have the chance of accepting Christ. Luke, again, talking to the Gentile who may be raptured. And of course, John doesn't mention it because if you've accepted the book of John, you are saved, right? So we've already reviewed, again, the Sermon on the End Times. We talked about all the things that have to happen before Jesus returns. We've talked about that a few sessions ago. Um, but now we're going to focus a whole lot more. When I say now, I probably mean next week. We're going to focus a whole lot more. And we're going to start and we're going to compare verse 1 of Matthew 24, verse 1 of Mark 13, verse 5 of Luke 21. We're going to look through them, each one, and we're going to focus on the similarities and the differences and then how they line up with each seal. And then once we get through all of that, we'll continue through Revelation 6 and do it verse by verse. Any final thoughts or questions? Yes, sir. Yes, that won't be next week. But... No, you're right. It won't be next week. It'll be the week after. Yes. Can you give us, like, what scripture you're going to compare so that we can yes. write those down and have them in front of us? I will do that. And uh, do you want me to just tell you now or email it to you or what? email it or text it okay i will email to whoever whoever would like it but again all of matthew 24 just for those who want to have it for next time all of mark 13 and luke 21 starting from verse 5 and we're going to line all that up to revelation 6 and as we go through that you're also going to have a couple references to a couple other uh passages in luke and uh luke 17 what is it uh, Mark is chapter 13. Yeah, and you'll you'll see because it's it's the same conversation. They're all written beside each other, and you can literally just make three columns and write each verse as you go down. 
but you're going to find that the book of Luke has a section about the desolation of Jerusalem that the others don't include. And you're going to find there's parts that the others do include that Luke omits. And then you're going to see the promise in Luke that you can avoid all of it. And that's a big statement, unless you can avoid all of it, which would be by rapture, right? And then, all like I said, Revelation 6, look at the seven seals that are there. The first six seals are in Revelation 6. So there's going to be a few. So in Luke 17, you're going to find a couple of the uh, comparisons to what it's going to be like at the return of the Son of Man. It's near the end of the chapter. Talks about the days of Noah. Talks about the days of Lot. And uh, it's it's a kind of a companion passage to Luke 21. That's uh, Luke 17, verse 20 through 25. And I, like I said, if anybody wants to give me their email addresses, I'll send you a side-by-side -side comparison of these uh, of these passages. And then we'll talk about them next time we're together.